Good morning, everyone. We're letting people come in from the waiting room. Numbers are still climbing, so just another minute. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. My name is Maria Thacker Gothi. I'm president and CEO for Georgia Bio. We're the Life Sciences Trade Association in the state of Georgia that works to uh, bring together and, and, and help businesses in the biotech, pharmaceutical, medical device, therapeutics, and um, many other uh, different subsectors of the life sciences sector um, do business here. Um, our industry continues to grow here in Georgia, and we're very excited to have today two of our um, our larger members, Takeda and CSL Bearing, with us to talk about this very important COVID-19 Plasma Alliance. Um, <clears throat> we have four speakers for you today, and we're going to be asking our uh, local resident government affair partners with each of them, Marcus Downs and Takeda and Tony Mitchell at CSL, to queue up this conversation about the Plasma Alliance before we turn it over to um, the representatives from their respective companies to really dive into the details of this really unprecedented alliance. Um, before I turn it over to our speakers, I'd like to thank our sponsor um, and our partner on this event, um, Newton County Economic Development, uh, and Dave Burned over there. He's been a great part of our Ecosystem Development Committee, and we're pleased to say he is joining us on that committee as a vice chair. So um, Newton County is very important to our, our state. Uh, the work that's happened in that community uh, through public-private partnerships has really enhanced not only their education system, but really grown the industry over there um, in life sciences and a number of other manufacturing and, um, um, and tech sectors. So um, thank you for your partnership and, and putting on this event. So today, um, I'd first like to queue up, um, <clears throat> um, I believe we're having Marcus speak first from Takeda and to kick us off on this really important alliance. So Marcus, can I turn it over to you to discuss Takeda here in Georgia? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Maria. And thank you to Georgia Bio for uh, really organizing this event. Uh, this is a very uh, timely cause, and we are proud to partner with CSL Bearing and so many other companies uh, to try to make a meaningful contribution to the world when it's, uh, when it's at its deepest need. Uh, so just a little bit about Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we broke ground in Georgia in about 2013. Uh, a little small town called Social Circle. Uh, we made about a $2 billion plus investment in creating one of the world's most state-of-the-art manufacturing and plasma fractionation facilities. Uh, we're very proud uh, of that facility. It's a little more than a million square feet. Uh, and right now we're able to boast about 1,400 employees company-wide in the state of Georgia. That includes not only individuals that are employed at the facility, but it also includes individuals who are employed at our uh, BioLife Plasma Collection Centers as well. Uh, we expect that we'll have a, a, an increased number in the, in the coming years, uh, but we've uh, been able to be good partners with the state in, uh, in the economic development space. Um, I've referenced BioLife Plasma Collection Centers. We have eight of them in the state. Uh, several of them are in Metro Atlanta or right outside Metro Atlanta. We have one in a rural type setting, uh, Warner Robins. Um, and then we have uh, a couple in metropolitan type settings, uh, Augusta, Savannah. Um, and so we are, uh, again, we're proud to partner with CSL. And again, thank you BioLife for, uh, and Georgia Bio for hosting this call. 
Great. Thank you, Marcus. And um, we're always excited to see today to continue to grow here in our fair state. Um, so next up, I'd like to invite Tony Mitchell, uh, who also sits on our policy and advocacy committee here at Georgia Bio, uh, to talk about CSL bearing here in Georgia. Thank sure. You. Thank you. And uh, I think I'm, I'm off of mute. So, uh, Maria, thank you for, for having us today, um, you know, to, like Marcus said, be a part of this. This really interesting conversation and very important conversation, especially during these times. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly happy to work with Takeda and, and Georgia Bio, but, um, you know, for, for those who aren't familiar with CSL, I'll give you a bit of background on, on our company. So, uh, CSL Bearing, we are a global therapeutics, biotherapeutics company um, that specializes in a number of plasma protein derived therapies to treat people with serious life threatening medical conditions. So, our U.S. headquarters is in the King of Prussia area in Pennsylvania, um, while globally we have headquarters in Australia. So, um, CSL Plasma is a division of CSL Bearing that operates our robust plasma collection network um, that collects a source product that is key in manufacturing the essential medicines that we use for a number of vulnerable populations. So if you think about uh, individuals with primary immune deficiency, hemophilia, uh, hereditary angioedema, um, in addition to those suffering from shock and burn. Um, so in the state of Georgia, we have 10 plasma centers um, across the state that are up and running and we have a few more on the horizon and you can expect our centers to employ around 60 individuals per center so throughout the state we probably have around 600 jobs um, in the state of Georgia. Um, at CSL we're huge proponents of just community investment as well um, so in, in the local economies we, we probably infuse about five to six million dollars in the economies through wages expenditures and donation dollars um, and then um, just for, you know, this discussion, I just want to highlight the fact that plasma donation is just such a critical part of our, of our business. So uh, following the call, I'd be happy to share any additional information <clears throat> on how, you know, we can spread the word about plasma donations or for individuals who are on the call to be involved themselves. So again, Maria, thank you. And uh, Takeda, we certainly are, are happy to partner with you guys on this one. Great, thank you. And I'm actually gonna pause for one second. We're having a minor technical issue on Christina's side. Um, I'm, uh, I apologize for this, um, the joys of doing this, and relying on technology for these types of things. So I apologize, um, one second. Okay, okay, I think we have her back. All right, great. Well, with that, um, <clears throat> we're very excited to have with us uh, Doug Lee, the Senior VP for Global Plasma Product at Takeda, and he's going to be our first speaker, and I'm going to let Doug and Sasha kind of go through this presentation and pass it back and forth. They, they, they know each other as they're working together on this important um, <clears throat> alliance. So um, we're very excited to really learn to understand how the COVID-19 Plasma Alliance is, is moving along. It is an unprecedented partnership of some of the world's leading uh, plasma companies um, <clears throat> uh, that you know do everything from collection, development, production, and distribution. So, and what's really important that we've seen in these times is uh, our industries come together and collaborate in ways that really just hasn't before. And this is a perfect example of that. So rather than pursue and individual research are really uh, putting patients and the public first to really combat COVID-19. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Doug. Thank you, Maria. It is a, actually a very much a pleasure to be here today. And I thank, thank you and Georgia Bio for the opportunity for myself to and, uh, and for Sasha to have a chance to, to speak and tell you about what we're doing. Let's go ahead to the first slide, uh, to the next slide, and we'll get started right into it. Look, so what is the Alliance? Um, you can actually see it's, this is during this time, and we use the term unprecedented quite a bit as we talk about the COVID-19 um, pandemic that's going on because it is unprecedented. And to that end, um, a few months ago, uh, some of us got together and said, look, it's better that we pool our resources and kind of come together to follow through and bring a product to the market. The hyperimmune approach is well known and understood in the plasma industry. So it's in, in that case, it's or in that approach, it makes a lot of sense to let's take our resources of multiple companies, normally competitors, to kind of bring us together and see what we can do to bring something faster and utilizing, and I'll use the word again, unprecedented approach to get us to, to address the issues that we're dealing with. Again, it's a pandemic and it demands bold moves as, the, as, um, as we look at it. And it includes several companies, um, both 
um, both to, beyond Takeda and CSL, of which we are um, technically the, far, the founders of, but it relies on all of us to actually come forward and, and to bring, uh, bring this to the, to the market and bring it to fruition, frankly. Um, we also work with several organizations, even outside of the plasma and pharmaceutical industry, to have actually helped us um, get us along and, and move the needle, if you will, on our progress. Next slide. So the goal here is really to come forward with a non-branded hyperimmune product. And what the non-branded hyperimmune product is, is really, um, it's the isolation of antibodies from those individuals who have um, been exposed to the virus and have recovered from the virus. And this plasma is called convalescent plasma. And the plasma is rich with antibodies that can, has the potential to neutralize and to help clear the virus. Um, it's really just one angle that we would look to take. Um, a hyperimmune approach is a good angle. It's a solid one, as I indicated before. It's a path we've all taken before. So it is a known approach. Um, and by coming together and looking at bringing forward this hyperimmune, our goals are really to accelerate the development of this um, medicine, um, improving and then providing a supply from a really, rare, a really natural and somewhat rare resource today, and that is one of plasma, and specifically those, that plasma coming from individuals who are um, recovering or who have recovered from the disease. It's a challenge, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and this is where we look to our, our colleagues in various states to help us bring the messaging along the way. By coming together, um, we do really do bring a lot of synergies because we understand the areas of plasma collection. We understand the areas of isolating proteins, antibodies from, from various, um, from plasma. And we understand the goal and the, the need to run our clinical trial and how to do that together. So at the end of the day, this is what it is. It's about a sharing of goals. It's about a bringing together companies that um, wouldn't normally be working together, actually, in many cases, uh, most cases, competing with each other, but frankly, bring it and reducing it to a practice that will um, help the better good. Next slide. This is the companies that are involved. You can see the founders of um, Takeda and CSL Bearing as we're sitting up there, and then we have the various member com companies and the contributors who are also providing um, the, the range of work and effort, a lot of the effort in the members and contributors are really focusing on obtaining um, plasma that's of high quality that we can use in the production and the manufacturing. Um, Takeda itself is, has a manufacturing site located there in Covington. It's been an instrumental site in moving the program along. CSL Bearing has a manufacturing site that we're utilizing in, in Bern, Switzerland to um, produce one of our product or produce the product there as well. And then I ask you to look across the bottom at the supporters. These areas are these, these people that you wouldn't normally see attached to a, uh, or these companies you wouldn't normally see attached to a plasma drive or a pharmaceutical company that have actually contributed and really helped us drive this programs forward. Not only, I mean, we can deal with the technical, we're good at that, but to have folks that can actually, and, and expertises that can help us with um, public service announcements, web designs, things like that is really fundamental and has really been foundational to seeing us through and what we've done. Next slide. So with this, I'm going to uh, hand it over to my friend and colleague, uh, Sasha, Dr. Sasha Haverfield. Sasha. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. And just by way of background, so I serve as the Global Head of Regulatory Affairs for Takeda's Plasma Device Therapies Business Unit. I also have a CEO of clinical trial work. And as a side job, I now um, coordinate the development of this hyperimmune product for, for Takeda as part of the alliance. So pleasure to be here. Looking forward to your questions. And before we get any further, maybe let's move on to the next slide here, please. And actually, what is that hyperimmune product? What, what are we actually talking about here? It's commonly referred to now as COVID-19 or COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Immunoglobulin 19. And what it is, and Doug already alluded to this, it's a highly purified preparation of human immunoglobulins that are derived from human convalescent plasma. So from plasma from patients that have successfully cleared COVID-19 and have survived the infection. And out of that, we isolate antibodies against um, the coronavirus. And those antibodies are then transferred to a patient in a highly purified 
uh, consistent preparation, so a pharmaceutical product that allows the patient to um, clear the infection. And we will look at this in our upcoming clinical trials. So if you go to the next slide, We are doing this work and you saw the impressive list of partners that have come together under the Alliance also in collaboration with the US government and specifically here, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health and the NIAID, the Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, we are partnering with the NIH in order to conduct the global phase three clinical trial. And that's another important factor in how we are working together as an industry, as a public sector, actually all of society, in order to accelerate the availability of a very promising therapy to patients. Each one of us could do a clinical trial. There will be four hyperimmune products that will go into this clinical trial. And while each of us, each one of the companies participating and partnering here with the NIH would have the resources and the experience to do a clinical trial, it would take us significantly longer to test the medicine and to determine if it's safe and effective for the treatment of patients. And so we decided to partner with the NIH to do one clinical trial, to pool our hyperimmune preparations, to pool the results, to come to the conclusion, is it safe? Is it effective? And if the answer is yes to that, how quickly can we bring this uh, new medicine to um, US patients and then later on to patients globally? Our intent is to treat patients that are hospitalized. This is the primary indication for this hyperimmune globulin product in the initial clinical trial. That means patients who are sick enough that they have to seek medical care, that they need to come into the hospital, but they are at the beginning of their progression. That means that they are not yet sick enough that they need to be intubated or would be on ECMO but are patients where we want to prevent them from taking a clinical course that is much more severe, um, would land them in the ICU and have potentially very negative outcomes and where we see high death rates. Let's go to the next page, please. So manufacturing. Um, Doug already touched on this and, and beforehand, there will be two manufacturing sites for between Takeda and, and CSL. The US manufacturing side will be run by Takeda, and that is our Georgia manufacturing facility in Social Circle, Georgia, the, this brand new facility. And then CSL Bearing will manufacture in Bern um, at their Bern, Switzerland uh, location. What you see here on the left-hand side is actually that golden plasma, that convalescent plasma. And this is probably regular plasma that you see here or, or a stock picture of that. And you see how plasma is collected in either bags or in bottles. And then on the right-hand side, you see the very sophisticated fractionation process and purification process through which we extract the antibodies from this plasma um, and make it into a hyperimmune preparation, a um, pharmaceutical product. And the most, if you're not familiar, if you've never been in a um, fractionation facility or in a plasma facility, probably the most um, analog process would actually be oil fractionation. So oil refining, where you split off different components of a liquid into its individual components, right? Based on, based on their physical properties, obviously in a very much more sophisticated pharmaceutical environment. Let's go to the next page here. With that, plasma donations. Doug, why don't I hand over to you again on plasma donations? Thank you, Sasha. Uh, let's go ahead and move to the next page. As I indicated to you before, plasma is the first challenge. Now, Sasha and I speak um, quite frequently uh, because we both coordinate our efforts within our respective companies. And um, we have different challenges um, every time we speak. It's very different almost every time or they rotate. But one that shows up quite a bit is around plasma and making sure that we have enough plasma to not only fill the pipeline that we have for um, our clinical trial material, but beyond that. Because once we go beyond the clinical trial, we have to have enough plasma to continue to make product for the general population. And so convalescent plasma, that plasma which has coming from patients who have recovered or from individuals who have, don't, have recovered from COVID-19 is our key raw material for getting us where we need to go. And we're doing a lot around identifying donors and making our, making our stories out there. That's what the Alliance does. Um, as to use Sasha's word, the impressive list of, in, of different companies to actually get the word out there 
for donations to and for donors and their subsequent donations to be provided for these therapies. This is a safe and proven process. It utilizes an approach called plasmapheresis, which really isolates only the plasma or the or the liquid portion of blood um, to um, which contains those proteins of interest in that we would uh, need to purify. And in this case, the antibody fraction, which includes, of course, a subfraction of that having um, uh, the hyperimmune activity or the, the reactivity against the targeted virus. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, look, I'm not going to get into all the details, but this is really talks about how you actually get from a plasma to ultimately distribution in the field. And uh, look, I, we can't speak enough about the importance of having plasma. Without the plasma, it's very clear to everyone on this call that making a product is becomes impossible. We have to have the plasma. And we're, we'll talk more about how we're continuing to raise awareness on that. Once we get the plasma, uh, whether it's convalescent or from our normal donors that we provide um, other products for, it's processed. And it doesn't look like the cartoon here. It looks more like uh, Sasha's image a moment ago. A lot of stainless steel in very large quantities. So, uh, but this illustrates the point. There's processing attached to it. Isolation, there's a lot of biochemistry attached to it in engineering. And to that end, it's also um, there's also additional steps to ensure bloodborne pathogens are passed through. We do a lot of work to ensure the safety of our products, and we have a long track record as an industry now around that. Um, clinical trials are performed to demonstrate the efficacy, the safety, the quality of the products that we provide, and of course, there's a regulatory approval at uh, nas typically at national levels, at federal levels, both here in the U.S., of course, and in other parts of the world. Once it's made available, the challenges don't stop, or once it's approved, the challenges don't stop. It's always about distribution and making sure that product reaches the patient, reaches the providers in such a manner that it maintains its efficacy and safety. Um, and these are very complex um, supply chains, but they are also very well understood and known, and we've been doing that for many, many years as an industry. Uh, next slide. Look, this is Georgia. This is what Georgia has done for us and what it does, uh, What, in addition to having a place to put a very nice manufacturing plant, this is where the plasma collection centers are located. And I'm sure um, you recognize all of these centers or all of these cities and towns in Georgia that have um, the capability of contributing to this. Bearing in mind, we have an, a national approach to it. This is a very nice and very good representation of plasma centers that can provide to uh, and ha can help participate in uh, this um, endeavor that we're looking at. Actually, when I, I saw this over the weekend, I looked at this presentation again, and I'm just very impressed with um, what Georgia has brought to the table here and, and, their co and your contributions there. Next slide. Uh, look, that's not me in the image, contrary to what you might think. It's actually, we have this very strong and very good alliance around um, uh, bringing, um, bringing our, um, our repu uh, bringing uh, awareness to what we're trying to do. And the fightinennis.org is one of the social media platforms we're leveraging with celebrities such as The Rock to actually bring the message forward. And I love the message. The fight is in us. It's really very, very true. Um, the goal here is to encourage plasma donations to ultimately lend itself to, to, uh, to fight COVID-19. And you can see all the contributors below, all the participation below about identifying the value of plasma for whatever use, identifying the plasma specifically though in this case to fight COVID. Uh, and it's really the target is to go out there and make people aware that they have something to give to, ma to make them aware they have they bring value at to beyond their own bodies and to others in the larger um, in the larger sphere of public health. So it's very exciting time to be a part of it. We're part of it as of course the COVID-19 Plasma Alliance, but you have others aware with America's Blood Centers, Mayo Clinic, and others as you see listed below there. Next slide. So with this, I'll hand it back to my colleague, Sasha, to follow up on the potential. Thank you, Doug. So the fight is in us. Let's go to the next, um, next page here. 
because that fight um, is, and the, the promise of convalescent plasma is probably one of the most likely new medicines for the treatment of COVID-19 for hospitalized patients to come forward in, in time for a potential wave two or certainly before the end of this year. So this clinical trial that I um, told you about a few minutes ago that we are initiating together with the, um, with the NIH um, will enroll later this summer. And we expect to have results um, in the fall to early winter because our goal here is to use the clinical trial results and submit those clinical trial results to the FDA, to EMA, um, to regulatory authorities in, in Japan to pursue an approval of a hyperimmune product, a non-branded hyperimmune product, COVID-19, cough IG-19, um, for the treatment of hospitalized um, COVID-19 patients. And that should actually happen before the end of this year, assuming that the clinical trial proceeds as, um, as intended. We will then look at um, the pandemic itself and ask ourselves the question, how can we serve the most patients? Where do we need to register this, um, this preparation in order to save lives? How is the pandemic developing? As you can see, it turns on a dime. It is quite unpredictable. And we have seen now a resurgence in the US quite significantly in Western and Southern states, um, while Europe has, has abated a, 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 a little bit. So we will be looking at the development of the pandemic. We will look at patient numbers and then decide how best to distribute the product to, uh, to impact as many patients as we can as quickly as we can. If approved, we need to manufacture the drug. It all depends on the availability of convalescent plasma. And that is why the fight is in us. That is why you see um, celebrities like The Rock, Samuel L. Jackson and others to make personal um, um, PSAs, so service announcements, public service announcements, in order to encourage people to actually see if you have survived COVID-19, if you have won that fight, you can help others, you can potentially save lives. And this is what this alliance is about. This is what our collaboration with the NIH is about. And this is how we've set this up. Our goal is to bring a new medicine to patients before the end of this year. This is not the only approach that is needed here. In order to fight this virus, we need vaccines. They are in development at the moment, and we are hoping to see the outcomes of vaccine clinical trials later this fall as well, early, um, early winter, and then hopefully have widespread availability of a vaccine or vaccines to uh, prevent um, SARS-CoV-2 infections, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, sometime early next year. We are also encouraging the, the use of convalescent plasma for direct treatment purposes. However, these are all um, approaches that have to come together for us to, to be successful in the fight against this virus and reopen our economies. So with that, let's maybe go to the next um, slide. So what is our ask? Convalescent plasma, it is critically important to our ability to make a hyperimmune product and to bring this new medicine to patients, even to conduct the clinical trials. So our ask is of all of you here on the phone, of all of the organizations, of everyone that you interact with, if you know someone that had COVID-19, if you speak to people who could be encouraged to either get the word out or who themselves may be plasma donors, please encourage them to either go to the, um, to the participating companies themselves like BioLife, which is the plasma collection company for Takeda, CSL, Biotest, Octopharma, Adma, any of the plasma uh, collectors in order for this plasma to go into the manufacturing clinical trial process or send them to donate plasma fight COVID-19. This is the Fight Is In Us um, a website, which then has a bot um, that is supported by some of the technology companies that you saw on the earlier page that allows people to triage and find out what is their closest convalescent plasma or pl closest plasma collection center so that their plasma can be routed. However, hyperimmunes are not the only product that is made from um, plasma. And even for, for plasma that does not come from someone who has survived COVID-19, so regular plasma, many, many essential medicines for the treatment of primary immunodeficiency, for example, or inherited diseases, rare diseases come out of plasma. And so we try to encourage both. We try to encourage very much under this pandemic, 
the, the donation of convalescent plasma, but let's not forget also about the importance of regular plasma and plasma donations in order to bring medicines to, to patients in need, especially here in the US, but also across the entire globe. And with that, I think this was my last slide. Let's see. Yes, it was, and I'll hand it back to you um, for any questions or, or any follow-ups here. Maria? I believe you may be on mute. Oh, there we go. I'm talking to myself. Sorry. I had to switch to my phone. My internet's spotty today. Thank you, gentlemen. That was outstanding. I really appreciate that and, and that clear call to action, which I'll just reemphasize that you know, this is something that, of course, here in your professional circles, um, you know, the website to fight is in this and the importance of donating plasma if you have had COVID. Um, but this is something you should share in your personal uh, social media channels as well. It's a, the fastest way to get the word out about things like this. And, and it's very important that we as, as humans come together around this. So um, one other thing that I'd point out too is a resource uh, for those that are tracking the, you know, vaccines and therapeutics pipeline, um, bio. bio um, excuse me, .org, <clears throat> they've set up a, a COVID-19 therapeutic development tracker in partnership with BioCentury and um, <clears throat> a Biomed Tracker. So that's a good place to see where things are at, too, if you want to keep yourself informed. Um, that's done collaborative, collaboratively with the industry, and we're, we're the state affiliate of Bio, so we do endorse that, and we do hope that you'll, you know, if you have regular questions on where things are at, that's updated every Monday, I believe. So I encourage you all to look for that for other pieces. But I actually think you guys, gentlemen, answered most of the questions that have been submitted. So we do have a question from um, uh, Stan Harrison. Uh, there's, let's see here. Um, okay, uh, there seems to be a dearth of antibody testing, at least here in Georgia. So are you hearing about that bottleneck to identifying patients for plasma? I put that to either of y'all. I'll start. I think that generally across the board, we're seeing a lot of testing and the, an amplification of testing nationally around this as well. Um, and actually even in, our, in Europe as well. Um, the key though is that a lot of people are getting, I believe, this information for their own use, their own understanding. It, the goal would be then to take those people now, let them know they have something of value if they have a positive signal or if they get a positive signal. And if you have something of value, can you bring that value now to bring it to the larger good and to, to make awareness of it? So um, we are getting plasma, it continues to grow, but to main, what I, I think is important for folks to know, beyond the clinical trials which will be coming forward, we need to maintain that pipeline and of full plasma from convalescent patients to ensure that um, uh, the patients are covered that would be treated by this material that we would get. So it's, it's one thing, it's interesting to start, but it's about maintenance and momentum going forward as well. Mm -hmm. Sasha. Let me, let me add to that because there's one, uh, and this is a great question because it, it raises a, uh, a number of issues related to how people actually become aware of plasma donation and what qualifies a plasma donor here. Mm -hmm. It is actually not necessary to have an Ig test, a positive Ig test or an antibody test in order to become a COVID-19 plasma donor. What is required by FDA is that one has documented disease by a healthcare provider or one had a um, a positive virus test. So if you were sick at the time, you got diagnosed, you had a virus test and assured that you were SARS-CoV-2 positive, you are a potential donor. If you had an Ig test, so an antibody test, that also would qualify you as a donor, but it is not necessary. So when a potential donor for convalescent plasma enters a plasma facility, there is a, um, there is a series of questions and medical exams that one goes through to make sure that the donor is healthy enough to, to donate donate convalescent plasma, one has to have fully recovered from the disease at least 15 days out, ideally 30 days out. Um, and then we will test or manufacturers test on the back end for the presence of these antibodies. So again, it is not necessary to have an, uh, an antibody test. What is necessary that one had documented disease through various different mechanisms in order to become a donor. Great. Thank you both. Um, <clears throat> Uh, th Sarah, thank you for your question. I, we will be sharing of after this call within 24 hours um, uh, a follow-up note thanking all the participants, and we will include a link to the fightisendus.org and um, as well as a link to the bio tracking map. So we'll get that to you, and I'll also drop it in a response uh, to you to you now. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, Bill Jarvis is asking a question around how you're going to prioritize critically ill patients. Um, so given the long history of safe production of IG, is it feasible to get these products to critically ill patients prior to the full approval of the product? So let me maybe take that, Doug, from a, from a clinical trial perspective. Um, so it is critical for us to actually conduct a clinical trial and generate the hard evidence that this product is safe and effective for its intended use. The reason that we can go from February to July, August, um, from an idea to actually manufacturing to a phase three clinical trial, that's incredible acceleration. And that is due to the fact of the long history of safety, efficacy, and manufacturing with these immunoglobulin preparations. Otherwise, this wouldn't be possible. So we are already accelerating that, uh, that pathway. We will first have to conduct this clinical trial in order to determine, is it actually, is a hyperimmune product actually useful? Is it safe? Is it effective um, in the treatment of these uh, COVID-19 patients? And once we know that, we will accelerate the availability for patients through the regulatory pathway. If that is an emergency use authorization that then gets converted into a full approval in the US is to be seen, but there are various different mechanisms of making this product available to patients once we know it's safe and effective, as well as through the clinical trial process, which will have sites in the US, in Europe, in Japan, um, in Latin America, and also in APEC. So it's truly a global clinical trial with major, major sites um, involved in the United States. Outstanding. Thank you both. And, and I think this only goes to show that, you know, we're able to push the trial along more quickly than we typically would because of this collaboration. So, um, uh, thank you. Um, so, I think this is the last question I have right now. Uh, longer term, and you may not be able to answer this yet because we're still very early still, a longer term won't all of our plasma pools naturally contain COVID-19 antibodies. So, if you're looking out three to four years, uh, common products will naturally have that factor as part of the mix, right? Yeah, look, I, I see the question. It's a good question. And I'd Thank say you. very likely. That's how I would answer it. It's very, very likely as uh, viruses or other antigens kind of uh, permeate any given demographics, any given geographies, you start to see these naturally occurring antibodies start to form up there. Today, we're not there. And, it, and I think three to four years is a good window to put on this to, for an observational period to look at it. We're just, now getting, uh, we're just now getting the tools to start the screening and we brought those tools to bear on the COVID program itself. Um, but I think it's an excellent question. I think it's very likely that we'll start seeing it even as a family of viruses, coronaviruses are out there and we do know uh, obviously those that are less tenacious as COVID-19 uh, or sitting out there are members of the coronavirus family out there. We do see some signals. The key is getting a consistent, reliable product every time out the door. And two, we, first of all, we can't wait three to four years. And second of all, what we're doing here is concertedly pulling those plasma units that have a pure COVID signal that we can actually be sure we can address and, and yeah. utilize it in a product. Sorry, go ahead, Sasha. This is the very important um, focus here. Yes, we will likely see, as Doug said, um, antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus emerge in preparations at a later date. Right? Um, as we reach herd immunity, as more people become infected, as regular plasma donors have antibodies or get vaccinated, there will be increasing levels of antibody. But it will not be a concentrated hyperimmune uh, preparation. And what is key is these high concentrations of anti-SARS-CoV-2, so anti-the-virus neutralizing antibodies. And that's what a hyperimmune is. Because what provides, or what we believe provides the efficacy of a product like this is to transfer high levels of neutralizing antibodies against the virus into a patient in these early stages of their hospitalization when their own immune systems haven't had a chance to fight the virus yet. And while we expect to see some level of um, anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in regular Ig preparations, they may not be high enough to have a therapeutic effect. And so we have to distinguish between regular IgEs that are indicated for the treatment of primary and secondary immune deficiencies and other autoimmune diseases compared to a hyperimmune preparation that is dosed at very high levels specifically 
to neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a hospitalized patients and prevent them from actually progressing where they need to be intubated, where they need to be transferred to an ICU, where we see higher death rates, where we see the incredible impact on our healthcare system and our ability um, to keep our ICUs open. Great. Thank you both. Um, I don't think I have any other questions in. So if anybody has a question, please submit it. But I am going to um, invite our panelists. Um, and maybe I'll just go backwards here, Sasha. I'll start with you since you're on my screen. Um, any closing remarks? Anything you you know you want to end with outside of the call to certainly donate plasma? Um, so obviously, this is one of my main asks is the, the fight is in us, the fight is in you. Encourage everyone to donate plasma because that's how we save lives. Um, I see another question that has come up here and that allows me to touch on this. Will a hyperimmune actually be useful once we have a vaccine? And the answer is yes, we need both. We need vaccines and we need treatment options. We need antivirals like remdesivir made by Gilead that now has emergency use authorization, just like we need biologic preparations. All of these come together and build an armamentarium. There will be patients in the future that cannot be vaccinated. There will be patients who do not um, respond appropriately to a vaccine and will not get immunity. In order to fight this virus, in order to uh, contain outbreaks in the future, in order to contain people who will get this virus over the next one to two to three years likely, we need all of these treatment options in order to, to prevent the negative impact on our healthcare systems, to reopen our economies um, and to prevent um, very bad outcomes, including deaths in those patients. Great, thank you. Thanks for catching that question. Um, uh, Doug, did you wanna? Look, it's been, it's been an honor to be here. And I thank you, Maria, and your colleagues for inviting us to be and to come and to talk about what we're doing. We, we are excited about what we're doing. It is challenging, frankly, to actually pull multiple companies together. For anyone who's worked in a conglomerate or a large company, it's a challenge even within your company. Now we're actually looking across companies. So it's, it's always a challenge to, to bring, um, bring people together who haven't worked together, but it's been a lot of fun and we have actually made significant progress. The most progress I've ever, in, I've got more than 20 years experience in the industry. This is the fastest that I've ever seen a product come from concept to the point of production, which we're running today for clinical trial materials. Started our conversation, Sasha started in March of last year, or March of this year, and uh, <laughs> we're already, gosh, it does feel like a year has gone by. Uh, uh, so it started last March, and we're already in production in both facilities or in both companies for the clinical trial materials for distribution, as Sasha, Sasha indicated later this summer. That is truly, back to the word unprecedented, that is unprecedented. So it's been very good. And I thank, um, I thank you again for the time and the folks that have asked questions too along the way. No, definitely. Thank you, Doug. And I think we're, you know, unprecedented keeps coming up, but it just truly is. Our industry typically takes much longer to get these types of things done. And um, even with this speed, you know, as, as is pretty much all of our mandates, efficacy and safety are at the core. So we'll see how all these trials play out for all types of therapeutics and, and vaccines and treatments. So um, it, it's very important that safety and efficacy remain at the forefront of all we're doing. So thank you guys for this and congratulations on the um, uh, coordination. I, I, I know that wasn't easy because that is basically what we do at associations is coordinate communities. <laughs> um, I wanted to see if Marcus or Tony had any comments or wanted to close out as well. You can shake your heads if you'd like. Tony, you unmuted first, so I'll take that as a yes. Uh, did you want to say anything? Yeah, no, I was just going to reiterate what everyone else said. Uh, one, again, thank you for having us on here. I think that this is a very important conversation for us to be having, especially in the state of Georgia. But again, just promoting the need for plasma donations. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to, you know, this, the COVID IG calls and again, just for our normal course of business. So, um, you know, for anyone who has any additional questions, I know uh, we provided some information throughout the presentation, but anyone who has any additional questions, I'm here as a resource. Um, but happy to kind of work with you guys throughout this, um, you know, for the remainder of this. And no, perfect. Thank you. And Marcus? Yeah, so, you know, just like everyone else, I just want to reiterate uh, how important this conversation is, uh, express our, our most sincere gratitude for you hosting. Uh, it's wonderful to have so many of our colleagues that have participated on this call. And as Tony has indicated, uh, our companies do, um, 
a lot of really good work for a lot of individuals who need these life-saving and life-improving therapies. And so we stand as a resource. Uh, you know, we've reached out to uh, groups like the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus. We've reached out to uh, many of our health providers who serve in the legislature, uh, all in effort to make sure that the story of our companies, the story of what we're able to do for society uh, is able to, to resonate throughout the hall. So um, again, I wanna just thank you, Maria. Thank you to Georgia Bio and um, to Sasha and Doug. We really appreciate your expertise as well. No, thank, thank you all for joining us. I, I, I know you're very busy and pulling this together was, um, you know, a bit of, it was challenging because y'all are doing the hard work you need to be doing. I'd like to stress to those in the call and those that are members in particular, um, uh, policy work and government affairs at the core of what we do at Georgia Bio and it's really ramped up since COVID hit. Um, if you're not on our government affairs committee, uh, do reach out to us. Joseph Santor on our team manages that committee. Um, and uh, it, it, those sessions technically ended last week at a state level. We continue to do work with uh, our partners in DC, Bio, Pharma, Abdomed, and um, obviously continuing to maintain those relationships and speak on behalf of the industry um, at a state level too. Uh, the industry is certainly at the forefront of this response in particular. Um, <clears throat> So don't be sure to engage for company. You're not sure your company is on our policy and advocacy committee. Do let us, we're happy to check for you. Um, but we want to have people engaged um, at all levels there. So um, uh, a few housekeeping before we hang up. So just one quick minute. Last week, uh, we honored our award recipients uh, virtually. <laughs> it was an experience to have, you know, 130 plus people on the phone. But um, we want to congratulate those awardees again for their um their their innovations and and their leadership and um the deals they may have achieved over the over back in 2019 so um we appreciate everyone's patient too with doing this virtually unfortunately but uh we truly congratulate them again um uh that dinner was put on behalf of the late and great dr bob neerum who passed away in march right before the originally scheduled dinner and we heard some moving remarks from dr garcia at georgia tech on the um on, on you know bob's impact and on our community and quite frankly, the biotech sector globally and, and his Bob's lovely wife, Marilyn also joined us. Um, <clears throat> I also, you know, in case you missed it, uh, last week, uh, the state of Georgia did pass the hate crime legislation, which was a really important move and that, that narrative and um, uh, calls to action on behalf of the industry was threaded throughout our awards dinner. So it was a very moving evening and um, I'm very happy to, uh, say that Georgia Bio signed on in support of that legislation last week and we're pleased to see that leaders throughout the state uh, uh, move forward and made sure that happened and we're no longer in the minority as a state to have that type of um, legislation. Um, additionally, do keep in mind if you don't get our emails on Fridays, the Bio Beats, uh, I do try and we have a lot of great information, not only upcoming events around important policies and uh, items that are happening, not at this just the state level, but the federal level. Um, uh, right now, we know that the Senate Committee on Health, Education, and Labor is, has been examining lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, and there's some great takeaways we can share with you there if you're interested. So um, I, I think with that, I just want to uh, thank uh, Dave Byrne again and, and Newton Covington um, uh, Industrial Development Authority for, for helping promote this event and being a partner on it and their leadership in that region. I'd like to thank our speakers and Christina on my staff and Joseph for helping um, pull this today together. Uh, again, we're here for, for the industry. Uh, we're here for our community leaders and our legislators. If you need connectivity or you wanna um, arrange a socially distanced industry tour, uh, do let us know. We're happy to help take point in bringing that together. Um, and with that, I don't think I see any more questions. Do you gentlemen? Nope. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you again. And y'all have a safe day and a lovely 4th of July if uh, you have plans to socially distance safely and have still have fun with friends and family. <laughs> okay. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks all.